His wife had two beautiful babies. So I'm just so thankful for that. Why don't you guys stand and join us in worship today? Love is here, love is now. Come to the water, you who thirst, you thirst no more. Come to the Father, you who work, you work no more. You labor in vain into the broken chain. Love is here, love is now, love is pouring from his hands, from his brow. Love is near, satisfied. Streams of mercy. And as soon as y'all are done hugging necks and shaking hands, you can have a seat, if you will, please. All right, well, we are uh, getting ready to uh, continue in our worship, and part of our worship is uh, in, in the bringing of our tithes and offerings to God. We, we do that to offer our whole selves up to Him in worship, so the ushers are getting ready to come through to receive that. A uh, couple things along those lines. Um, if you've watched any of the news this week, of course, you know of the, the, the storms that have uh, raged through, in, in, uh, in, especially in the, in the northeast. I mean, it's hard to look around and see uh, some of the pictures. It's kind of even hard to believe uh, some of those uh, pictures uh, of things that are going on. And so we want to keep those folks in our prayers. Um, also, though, uh, the, 
what maybe hasn't gotten as much media attention around here is the situation of like our sister churches in Cuba. They, they've endured a big hit as well. And so our missions committee has asked that if, uh, if anyone is able and feels led to, to give above and beyond your, your tithe, to, to give a special offering towards our sister churches in Cuba, you can do that. You can just place it in one of the envelopes there and just write Cuba on it and we will make sure uh, that it gets there. Um, along those lines with our um, offering, uh, just just got to gotta let you know, I know that uh, we're all in a, in a tough spot when it comes to offering, and we've talked about some of the, the struggles that as a church family that we're having, and, and we've done our best as the, uh, with, with all the leaders and volunteers in the church working hard to, uh, to kind of cut costs and cut spending and, and uh, everything else. And uh, unfortunately, though, it, it has come to a point, uh, we're, we're blessed that it's taken so long to get to this point, but... Unfortunately, we had to uh, lay some people off this week. Uh, we've, we've had to um, discontinue five positions. And so uh, we want to be sure to keep those families in our prayers. I mean, they're, they're part of the family, and, and it's, it's hard to, to do that. Um, it's it's a, a difficult situation. But in order for us to be able to continue on as, as a church, fulfilling God's mission for us here, it's, it's a step that, uh, that we had to take. Um, and so, but we definitely want to keep those families in our prayers. Um, also, um, and, and I know it's tough because I'm sure some of you are saying, oh great, here he goes, talking about, talking about money again and, and all this. All they do in church is talk about money. But I just got to tell you, you know, church is really the only place that you hear that statement. Because, I mean, you, you don't sit in a restaurant and hear people say, Dad, they're bringing me a check? How dare they bring me a check? I mean, I came here to get fed. I mean, what, what do you mean they're bringing me a check? Or the grocery store, you know, what do you mean I have to pay? The church is the only place that that, that, that that happens where people complain about it. And so we, we, the, the economic reality of, of this life is we have expenses to pay in order to keep fulfilling what it is that God wants us to do. He's going to provide. He's provided in miraculous ways. But the day-to-day way that He provides is through you and through me and through the giving that we do uh, to, to sustain the ministry here. So I just want to encourage you in that, that... Uh, that God still has uh, amazing things for us to do here. And so we want to keep our eyes on that mission that, that we're called to help people meet, know, and serve Jesus Christ. And we want to, we want to stick with that. So um, the ushers are ready to, uh, to come through and, and receive the offering. And as they do, let's take a moment. Let's pray together, please. God, we thank You for this time that we can gather here this morning. And um, we thank You that even in the midst of uh, difficult situations, um, financial and otherwise, we, we just want to keep praising You. We, we trust You and we, uh, we ask for Your presence to be with us. We ask especially uh, this week that You're with those who have, have lost their jobs this week and that, uh, that You uh, provide for them and You protect them. And, and, uh, so we just ask Your hand to be upon them. And uh, we pray that You will uh, be with us as well to give us Your guidance and leading. Help us to trust You, to see where You're working and to be able to join You in that, that we can uh, all come together as a church family. Um, through, through the giving of our resources, but the giving of our time and, and effort as well to, uh, to help us to be able to continue to live out your mission for us in this community. So we pray that you take these tithes and offerings that we bring before you this morning. We pray that you bless them, and that you use them to further your ministry in and through this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my day, oh, my day, to let my whole life be a blazing 
Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Forever. Why don't you guys stand and join us? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Forever. Take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be. All for you and all your glory.
had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow He washed it white as snow He washed it white as snow He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of his winds and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions glitz by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affection are for me Oh, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so Yeah, he loves us Oh, how he loves us Yeah. 
You may be seated. Thank you all for taking us on that journey in worship, helping us to remember how much He loves us, and, and that it's not just a, a random thing that's out there, uh, ooh, I love you, but, but that it came to reality, it came to fruition in the fact that he, he paid our debt, yours and mine. He, he demonstrated that love even when we were far from Him. That He gave His life for us. Let's pray together. God, thank You so much for this time that we've been able to, uh, to worship You. To uh, lift up Your name. To be reminded of the story of the Gospel. That you love us, even when we're far from you. You love us, you pursue us, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we could be restored into relationship with you. And so God, our relationship with you doesn't have to be based on fear, it doesn't have to be based on, out of a sense of duty and obligation, but that it's a love relationship. And so God, I pray that you help us to live our lives in a way that shows that love, that shows the gratitude for that love, that we can show how that love has impacted us in the words we say, in the things that we do, when folks are watching, when folks aren't watching, that we can uh, grow and develop to be more and more like you. God, as we gather this morning, we uh, are mindful of the struggles that the folks in the Northeast are having and folks in other places that have been hit by the storms and uh, that there are folks right now who are without power and are um, outside and their possessions are gone and, and they're cold and they may be hungry. And so, God, I pray that you send people to meet those needs. That, that we as a church can, uh, can come and, and surround those people. I pray that you, you provide for them, that you protect them, that you give them your presence. And God, as we come into this time of worship, I'm sure there are other things on our hearts as well that we've brought in here with us. And so we just want to take a moment to lift our hearts up to you in a little time of silence. God, thank you for hearing our prayers. And as we uh, prepare to see what you have in store for us through your word this morning, pray that you will give me the words to say that you want me to say. That you will help us to hear what you want us to hear. That you will give us the courage and the strength to act on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we do dive in, I just wanted to be sure to uh, invite you all, uh, our our annual charge conference is coming up uh, this uh, this Tuesday at 6:30. Uh, it's a time that we get together as a church family, and, and uh, actually we're getting together with a bunch of church families over at Port Charlotte United Methodist uh, uh, to get a chance to, to worship together and, and spend time uh, with this. So if you can uh, tear yourself away from the election results for a little bit, come over and have a little time of worship. I encourage you to do so. We'd love for Edgewater to have a good showing over there. Um, and just really quickly, uh, uh, along the lines with the uh, election coming up on Tuesday, let me just 
speak a prophetic word of God for you here this morning. Regardless who wins the election on Tuesday, the world is not going to end on Wednesday. Okay, and, and regardless of who wins the election on Tuesday, the world is not going to miraculously be a better place on Wednesday. The, the thing that is going to be consistent from Tuesday to, to Wednesday are the relationships that we have and, uh, and, and relationships that you have with people who may or may not agree with the things that you believe in. They may believe in a different way than you do. I just want to encourage you um, just to be nice. Be nice. This has been a very contentious season. Um, for the first time ever, I've uh, I actually uh, disconnected my landline this week on cell phone only. And, and I tell you what, I'm breathing easier because I'm not getting 10 political phone calls a day. Uh, it's just a good thing. So it, it's been a difficult season. I know that uh, I was even talking with someone last night. who they're, they're having relationship difficulties with friends just springing up out of nowhere. Breathe deep. Keep calm and, and be nice. Just keep that in mind as we uh, proceed through this week. So, well, um, as we continue our series today, we're continuing our series called My Heart, Christ's Home. We're looking at our lives in terms of a house, looking at the different areas and aspects of our lives, kind of represented by the different rooms that you might find in a house. And as followers of Jesus Christ, you've invited Jesus into your life, into your heart, into the home of your heart. And so we're kind of getting the grand tour as we go through here. When we started this series, we started the first week, we talked about the study in the home of our heart, uh, this area where some of the most important things go on. And so we talked about priorities. We talked about the importance of lining our priorities up with Jesus's priorities. Uh, the second week, we talked about the dining room and we talked about uh, what is it that we seek after to try to satisfy our hunger and quench our thirst to meet these needs that we have. What is it that we seek after? Is it stuff that's not going to satisfy? Is it stuff that's not going to last? Or are we truly seeking after Jesus? Because Jesus is the only one who's going to satisfy us. Amen. Last week we talked a little bit about the, uh, the meeting Jesus in the living room. Spending time every day with Him. And we talked about how kind of that spending time uh, is really developed in, in prayer and developing our, our prayer life. And, uh, and we, we talked about the fact that we need to talk to God with gut level honesty. We need to talk to God about everything that's going on in our lives. We need to talk to God continually. And, and not only do we need to talk to God, but we also need to take time and we need to listen for Him to respond. Because prayer with God, this relationship that we have, is a, a two-way street. So today we're going to walk outside to the garage and, and take a stop in the workroom of, of the, the home of our hearts. Um, as I was thinking about the, the workroom and the garage, I was thinking this week, what would it be like if, if Jesus like actually walked into my garage at my house? Well, first of all, he wouldn't get very far because you can't really go in there very much. And, and thinking about it, I'm, I'm just afraid that he'd revoke my man card because um, my, my garage is just not a very manly garage. I mean, there's, there's stuff everywhere, tools, and, and, and I, I, I use some and I don't use some, and they're, they're kind of spread out all over the place. And because I, I don't do a whole lot with, with tools and things like that. Um, I just find that putting a tool in my hand is like uh, giving, a, giving a monkey a pistol. Um, it, something's going to happen and it's probably not going to be good for all parties involved. So um, I'm just saying. Um, so so it, it's a good thing that Jesus isn't really concerned that much about the physical things that I make. Because I would be sorely lacking along those lines. But he is concerned with what I'm making of my life. And he is concerned about what you're making with your life. We all, we all have tools that we have been given by God. We've all been given different gifts and abilities and skills and talents and experiences and, and financial resources and, and spiritual gifts. We've talked about the fact that when you receive Christ, when you're a believer in Christ, every one of you has received at least one spiritual gift. And, and so what are we doing with, with these tools? What, what are you building with what Jesus has given you. Maybe, maybe you took an honest evaluation. You say, really, I haven't done much of anything. You know, it's kind of like my, my, my garage where you say, well, I think it's there somewhere. I haven't, haven't used it in a while. Maybe you've never taken the time to actually take inventory about what God has given you. You, you don't know what you have. And, and maybe what you do have, you say, well, I don't, I don't know how God could use that experience or that talent that I have or that gift. 
Maybe you have some tools or experiences or talents, or maybe even God can use the hurts that we've experienced. And, and maybe sometimes we don't know what they are, and we, we don't know how to use them. Maybe, maybe you're just not building up to your potential. God, God has gifted you and called you to, to build something amazing, and yet you're just kind of trifling around building paper airplanes. Don't, don't you want to live up to your fullest potential? Don't, don't you want to be all that God has created you to be? There's sometimes I, I look out on all of us here in this room and I, I kind of see a, a room full of Lamborghinis that are, are driving through a neighborhood with speed bumps and 20 mile an hour speed limit. Kind of, kind of not, not living up to, to, to who it should really be. We should, we should be out tearing up the open road, obeying the posted speed limits. Um, God, God has equipped you. God has gifted you. I've been blessed along the way in my, I guess I'm coming to the end of my, my fifth year here, uh, to, to get a chance to see some of you do that. To, to see you, you, you living that out. To see some of you step out on faith. To see some of you jump in and try something new. Maybe, maybe it was tithing. To, to experience that gift from God. Maybe, maybe it was serving in some way. It, serving in the food pantry, the thrift store, wherever, the, wherever that might be. Maybe, maybe you've taken a step out and you invited someone to come with you to church. Maybe you've built up the courage to begin to to, to, to share with someone else about what it is that God's doing in your life. Someone from school or work or, or just in the neighborhood. Hey, maybe you've started spending time every day with God. I mean, the list is, is endless of the things that some of you are doing and, and of, of the things that we could do to be living up to our fullest potential in God. And, and it's been incredible to see those of you who have taken those steps forward, to see how, how God has responded with faithfulness to your faithfulness. And, and, and incredible things have happened. I, we, we have this uh, retreat that uh, a lot of our folks go on called the Emmaus Weekend. And it's a four-day retreat. And, and people come back from that. And they're just so fired up. There's this light in their eyes. And they, their face is glowing. And they're like, you know what? I want to do whatever it is that God wants me to do. Pastor, just, just point me in the direction you want me to go. I, I will do whatever it is that you want me to do. And they're just so excited. And there are many of you who, who are doing that. You're, you're, you've taken those steps out. You're taking intentional steps to live life the way God created for you to live it. And you are loving it. It feels good. You're in the zone. You're firing on all cylinders. So, so maybe, maybe you're at a point where you haven't necessarily been living that, but you say, you know, maybe I could. Maybe I could do that. Maybe, maybe God could use my life a little bit more. And maybe I want to start living that life, using the tools and resources that God has given me. So let's say I'm ready to kind of take on this remodel job. I'm ready to, to, to jump into this new project. Now personally, if I were to start a project uh, around the house, would I try to tackle it by myself? No, I've already talked about the tool thing. You know, I, I would call someone I know, someone, so some of you who, who have done this type of thing before. You, you know what it is that you're doing. Be, because I know on my own, I'm just not going to get it right. So if, if we broaden that out to kind of look at, at my whole life, if I want to make something of my life, if I want to start this project, if I want to live up to God's fullest potential for me, is it something I'm going to try to do on my own? Probably not. Unless I want it to kind of turn out like a three-legged coffee table or a crooked bookshelf, you know? There, there are two verses, as I was going through this week, that kind of, that, that, I, that I keep in mind when I, when I think about living out to God's fullest potential for me. And the first is Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, For I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength I need. That, that, that kind of that kind of sets my sights out there. That kind of gets me going in that direction to say, you know, I can accomplish anything that God wants for me to do. I may not feel like I can do it, but God, if God's calling me there, He's going to equip me. He's going to provide the way, so I can do anything. The sky's the limit. But then, so often, what do I do? I go, all right, I'm ready to go. Pew, and I take off, and and God's like, hey, wait a minute. And that leads me to the second verse sometimes, where it's John fifteen five, where He says, for apart apart from Me, you can do nothing. 
So when you look at these verses together, with God, I can do anything. Without Him, I can't do anything. I don't know about you, I've, I'm 44 years old now and, and the, the calendar pages are flapping by and so you take some time every once in a while to, to uh, look at your life and, and you think, you know, what, what is it that I'm making of my life? And, and you know what, I, I want my life to have meant something. I, I, I want for there to be things that are different here because I was here. I want to be able to use the tools and abilities and, and gifts that God has given me to make a difference. And not just for the here and now, but for eternity. I, I want my life to be fruitful. Jesus wants to teach us to be fruitful in our lives. He, he gives us the kind of a blueprint for fruitful living in, in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. This is Jesus teaching, and this is what he says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. And He prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned for greater fruitfulness by, my, by the message I have given you. Remain in Me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from Me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in Me and I in them will produce much fruit. And then the verse we read earlier, for apart from me, you can do nothing. A couple things I want you to notice about this, um, this passage here. Did, did it say anything about that the secret to fruitfulness is being really talented? Did it say the, fruit, the key to fruitfulness is being very skilled? Did it say that the, the key to fruitfulness is, is trying really hard? Or, 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 or not making any mistakes? Or that the key to fruitfulness is, is having this image of, of being perfect. Or, or does it say that, you know, the way that you're going to be fruitful is to obey this list of rules. Does it say any of that in there? No. What does it say? It says, remain in me. Remain in me. I grew up reading the New American Standard version of the Bible, and, and it, it, the word that it uses there is abide. Abide in me. That's a word we don't use a whole lot these days, but I love that word. It's just, to me, it's just chock full of, of meaning and, and depth and richness because there's this sense of, of, of connectedness. It, it, it kind of, just, just kind of an all-encompassing thing. It's kind of like, I hate to do this so close to lunchtime, but it's say you've got this bowl of ice cream and, and, and you take this chocolate syrup and you squeeze it on the top. Does it stay in this one hour on Sunday morning? No, what does it do? It flows all throughout. It goes, it covers it all. It changes the look of it. It changes the taste of it. It permeates every single area. Unless you got magic shelf. But the real stuff, it, 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 uh, it, it goes all throughout it and changes it. And, and that's the way when we abide with Jesus, it, it, it changes us, it covers us. It permeates every area. It, it gives us this, this, uh, a, a new flavor. A new look to our lives because He has permeated every area. Because we abide with Him. Because we are, we are connected. There's a depth of relationship there. So we need to be connected in order to be fruitful. Just like a vine that's plucked from a branch isn't going to bear any fruit, we can't bear any fruit in our lives if we are not abiding with, if we are not connected to Jesus. Because apart from Him, we can't do anything. So we need to stay connected. We need to stay connected through prayer, like we talked about last week. We need, we need to stay connected to Him by, by spending time reading His Word. Getting, getting to know Him better. Reading some of the stories about His life. Try, trying to live life like He is just right there with us. Permeating every area of our lives. Because when you abide with someone, I mean, part of the meaning of the word abide is, is to live with. The, the message paraphrase of, of this section says this in John 15.4. It says, live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. 
the more, the more that we abide in Him, the more that, that we're connected, the more that we're not only going to get to know Him better, but we're going to start to look like Him too. Not, not in any physical kind of way, but, but our priorities. Our priorities will line up more with His. Our, our character will be developed to demonstrate more and more the character of Christ. Our, our wants, our desires, our goals, all, all of these things begin more and more to be conformed to the image of Christ. We have to remember that it's a process. All of it. It's not kind of a snap your fingers and it's done kind of thing. The process, as it's kind of described in this passage, it talks about being pruned. So, so as we abide, then we're, we're pruned. God begins this process of, of working in our lives. Sort of like this home remodeling job. He begins to shape us into His creation, into His work of art. He creates us into His masterpiece. That's what you are, you know. You are, you are God's masterpiece. It says that right in Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. I know that's hard to believe sometimes because we don't necessarily feel like a masterpiece. I know more often than not, I... I kind of feel like a big old clunky chunk of rock, not necessarily a masterpiece. But in the workroom of the home of your heart, what, 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 he's, what He's making and creating through you is important. But far too often we, we use this doing as, as a way of judging ourselves, of comparing ourselves to others. And, and I think what He's doing through us is very important, but I think even almost more important, is, is what He's doing in us. It's important what He's making of me, not just what He's doing through me. Let's watch this video together. An original masterpiece. So don't, don't sell yourself short. Don't, don't hold back from giving your all, from giving your best to God, from living out this fullest potential. Don't look down on yourself because you think you're too young or you're too old or you're too poor or you're too untalented or you're too dirty or too broken or too tired. You are God's masterpiece. Let's pray together. And we're going to pray that, that prayer that we just heard. And I want to pray it together and I want us to pray it together out loud. And so say, Dear God, today I'm turning everything over to You. I'm not going to hold on to anything anymore. Your Word says that You will make me Your masterpiece and use me to do great things. I don't see how that's possible but I want that with all that I am. So please do whatever it takes to make me what you want. I love you, God. Amen. Each time we come and have communion, we're being reminded of that um, abiding relationship that we have with Jesus. This is a time to, to connect, to be intimate, to, to kind of just open your heart and, and allow Him to, to speak to you. It's a time of, of, of remembering who, who we really are. So each time we come together for communion, we remember that uh, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took the bread and He blessed it and He broke it and He gave it to His disciples and He said, take, eat, this is My body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And in the same way, after supper, 
He took the cup. He blessed it. He gave it to His disciples and He said, Take, drink. This is My blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of Me. Let's pray together. God, thank You so much for this time that we can abide. This time that we can be intimate with You. So I pray that You will draw near to us. That You will uh, speak to us. Remind us of Your love for us. Show us those areas in our lives where maybe we, we need a little bit of chiseling. So that You can continue to make us into Your, your masterpiece. So that we can then go and do the things that You have set aside for us to do. So God, we lift our, our hearts to You and in the same time, we lift our voices to You together as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught His disciples to pray by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Communion table in the United Methodist Church is open to all who will come who are seeking after a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The way that we do it here is the ushers are going to set up a couple of stations in the aisles. As they direct you, if you're able to get up out of your seat, just go to one of those stations. If you're not able to get up out of your seat, just let the ushers know and they'll be happy to serve you where you're seated. Um, as you come to one of those stations, you'll tear a piece of the bread off, dip it in the juice, and then eat it. At that point, if you'd like to come and spend some time in prayer at the altar, you may, or you can just return to your seat. But I'm going to ask those who are assisting with communion this morning now to uh, please come forward.
He is the God who is worthy. He is the God who uh, deserves our praise. He, he is the, the master. He is, he is the, the master craftsman, the master artisan who, who, who creates and shapes our lives. Our role is to, to be present in it. To not uh, jump off the potter's wheel, but, but to, to abide. To abide and allow Him to, to prune, not to, not to damage us, not to, to cut us down to nothing. But we're pruned so that we can bear fruit. He, he makes something of us so that then He can make something through us. And so as you go this week, go with the knowledge and understanding that you are God's masterpiece. That you were created in Him to be able to do the good things that He set forth for you long ago. So go from this place and and be that masterpiece and do those good things. Go in His name. Amen. See you next week.